I think regarding the South China Sea and any other disputes, I think for for Xi, it's less so of trying to create manifest destiny and more so rectifying historical wrongs, especially along the Indian Chinese border, because that's a relic of the hundred years of humiliation and the Indian colonial era that was never rectified even before India declared independence. Hello and welcome to episode 42 of Let Them Eat Cake. This will be the first part of a two-part episode. My name is Jack. My co-hosts are John and Ace. Today we are talking to the founder and writer of Sinotalk. As you could gather from the name, his content centers upon China from political to social. We delve into the CCP and its leadership, the state of the country, and much more. But before that, let's get to some headlines. First up, I'm going to be talking about uh, European immigration policy changes. The European Union is looking to follow the United Kingdom's lead when it comes to immigration policy. Germany, Italy, Austria, and Denmark are looking to export their irregular migrants to third-party nations. For the UK, it was Rwanda. For Italy, it's looking to be Albania and the rest up in the air. Either way, this policy is said to be some kind of deterrent but history and attempts by vastly different foreign nations elsewhere in the world have shown it's failed. Uh, Some of these countries are also looking towards shipping irregular migrants to some kind of offshore prison complex like Australia did with Christmas Island and Nauru uh, over the last 20 years. Uh, Another policy also shared by Australia would be immediate deportation to a secondary designated safe nation for whoever is seeking asylum. Uh, The issue is these nations like Austria don't have access to these isolated island colonies like Australia does, Uh, also taking into account that Australia is an island continent and could be argued that it requires a unique take. The EU uh, itself literally doesn't have an island to put them on like you do. There's literally nothing they can do. Mm. I don't know what they're saying. So it's like you, you could make an argument that Australia would need some kind of unique take on immigration and irregular migrants, uh, this isn't it. Uh, The plan is, again, like it was in Australia, a panic response to a crisis that the governments of these countries uh, are either too lazy, malicious, or stupid to comprehend uh, or deal with, and will lead to the same humanitarian crises that were faced um, when these actions were performed by the Australian state. Uh, These culminated in basically decades or more of essentially imprisonment for people fleeing persecution or claiming to be fleeing persecution. Um, So, yeah, that's that's looking pretty cool, pretty good. Doesn't like France have overseas departments that they could send them to? France probably does. France France isn't exactly uh, involved with this. France is. Mm. So France and Germany both like closed. They used to accept migrants and they've recently closed that. That's the big update there. But this has largely been run and like an idea that's been created. Well, it was kind of first like Rishi Sunak and then like Maloney came along and like Mm. uh, perfected it in a way. But like the the whole thing is like she wants to push them to Albania before they reach Italy so they can't (laughs) claim asylum, right? And like she already has like the Libyans killing people on the other side of the ocean. And then but the funny part is is that when she negotiated this deal with Albania to take these people, Rishi Sunak immediately was like, Hey, can we get in on this? And it's like, Who are you? You're not even like a part of this conversation. Go home. Basically all the ex fascist nations. Which is pretty funny. Italy is also mad at the EU, um, even though they're like super poor. Mm. Well, not super poor. They're they're the second bat- worst economy is the proper way to say it. You know, mm-hmm. so they're behind Greece. So like they have basically a federal bank that bails out uh, banks individually. If countries and if a certain country's central bank gets a run, then the EU has like a big vault to ensure that and bail out that bank. She doesn't like that because, of course, fascists are always against central banks for some reason. That's like a big hang up that they have. Is central banks, even though like Italy has like benefited from this policy getting bailed out in the past, I think three different times. I don't know. Anyway, talking about it's Italy, 
Uh, one Italy, time they one invaded in, Ethiopia. One, <laughs> one and only colony of Eritrea borders the next country we're going to be oh, talking also, about. But while we're in Europe, uh, Lukashenko, uh, he he made himself basically president for life. Mm. He, now he, said, I, he, he already was, but he said uh, president is now immune from prosecution. And then he, um, anyone who he banned with like political exile, like they had to flee the country, like the opposition did, the opposition leader that is, they're now banned from running. They can't run anymore. And it's like, okay, okay, buddy, whatever makes you feel better. Like he already has power. He already won. Like, but yeah, so um, a little bit of extension into the Red Sea crisis. A lot of people are more focused on the Houthi side, things like that. But as we've been reporting, there has been some escalations with Ethiopia. They say that they're, because uh, they're a landlocked country because Eritrea used to be part of it. Now it's not. Ethiopia basically said it's a matter of national security to have port access. So they literally are saying they will go to war over port access. So this has been complicated for a little while. A few months ago, Djibouti, basically their port contract fell out. Ethiopia was getting like high taxes in any way. It wasn't really a fair deal to them. But this culminates with the most recent mm -hmm. update in this. And uh, it's a, a lot of people don't know this place exists, but it's the nation of Somaliland. Uh, Somaliland, basically, um, Italy and Britain had different pieces of Somalia. The British part is where Somaliland is. They have been independent since the 1990s, maybe the 2000, I think 2001 or something like that. They held their official referendum, own currency, own passport, own license plate, own police force. Um, they have consulates in different countries. Like they're like one of the most legitimate nations. And like, you'll never see them as recognized as something like Kosovo. But um, what's also interesting is Taiwan is one of their like really, really good allies because like, they're just like Taiwan because they want to be independent from Somalia. So Ethiopia went in here to this independent nation that nobody recognizes. Not nobody, but you know what I mean. Um, and uh, they got a deal with them to access a port for 50 years, which is like awesome for Ethiopia. Um, even, you know, even though I, we don't like uh, the guy running it, you know. Didn't uh, Somalia didn't like this um, because they, you know, it's like they don't recognize it. They want a stake in the pot. They're like, no, you have to go through us. We have to get the money. You know, They're just you know how like China cries when Nancy Pelosi visits. Didn't they launch jets? As I like don't. A, know. They did. They do all that kind of stuff. You know. <laughs> but the thing is, is that the the United States. A lot of people somehow want to turn this into America bad. But, like, the United States doesn't recognize this place. They're not exactly, like, cool with Ethiopia because of the genocide. But the United States, like, is in Somalia. So, like, what is Somalia going to do? The United States are standing right there to be like, uh-uh. <laughs> back it up, guys. You're going right back home. Like, they can't mobilize an army. Like, what yeah, are they going to do? There's no way. There's no way. Yeah. You know, so, that, that would be ballsy. Go ahead, Ace. You know who can mobilize? Al Shabab. Before Al -Shabab before we get there, I just wanted to comment. <laughs> Somaliland, they actually have a little bit of an ISIS problem. What's the sap called that they gave the baby Jesus? Frankincense. They farm frankincense. So you like cut the trees and the sap comes out. Yeah. And so like ISIS has been controlling some of these fields and like taxing people, but it's like a very small presence. And uh Somaliland is technically the most free country in the region. If you go down to like Kenya, Rwanda, they have more, but just like in that Horn region, Somaliland is technically the most free. Um, they've had five peaceful elections, electing three different presidents between those elections. And they have um, Freedom House gives them a 44 out of 100 ranking, which uh, gives them the status of partly free. I know a while back they used to be considered like fully free on that index. But yeah, I know it back, hasn't been uh, too great to, lately. Back, back to the fellows, Al Shabab. Sorry, which is basically what their what their name translates to is the fellows. So they've done a lot of uh, saber rattling towards Ethiopia um, because of this deal, and you know because they see it as kind of taking a similar position to Somalia here. They see it as like a violation of their, you know, uh, territorial integrity or whatever. And 
they've they've you know their spokespeople have made a lot of speeches threatening Ethiopia, this, that, and the other. They've held rallies in areas where they have like a zone of influence, we'll call it. A lot of people show up to those rallies. I mean, in general across Somalia, even in non El Shabaab controlled areas, there have been a lot of protests regarding what um uh, Somaliland and Ethiopia have cooked up. And I think it's important to remember that um, this is definitely one of those moments where I think an eye should be kept on Al Shabaab because um, this this is something I think they would they would be willing to focus some of their uh, I guess their operational power or their means towards because if you understand the history of Al Shabaab when they sort of emerged as an uh, as an independent entity back in 2006, it was when UN-backed Ethiopian troops and Somali uh, government forces started an offensive against their uh, predecessor organization called the Islamic Courts Union. And um, that was kind of basically when Al-Shabaab kind of came into its own and they kind of became their, their own thing. They sort of distinguished themselves from the rest of the umbrella organization that they were under, which, as I mentioned earlier, was the Islamic Courts Union. So this is this is kind of historically like, I don't know if a soft spot is the word for them, but for it, but this is this is something where you know, there's some pretty recent history there. And I think they would be very willing to, I don't know, do something to fuck this up if they could. I mean, if you recall, a few months back, they, they attacked that, um, uh, the Lapset port court. I mean, they've, they've done it several times, but they, they, they occasionally carry out attacks on this thing called the Lapset corridor, I believe it's called, which is this like Chinese backed and, um, sort of East African backed, like, uh, project out in Kenya where um, they're basically trying to build like uh, like some it's it's a several economic di- different economic uh, yeah it's part of the whole like yeah. East African economic yeah. union that's yeah. supposed to like up with the area economic projects there one of them is a port another one's like a highway and so every now and again they'll like they'll just go in there they'll send some guys over the border they'll you know shoot up the workers you know, set up some IEDs to target trucks that are working there, stuff like that. So this is something where I could, you could see some cross-border attacks here and there if this is something that Somaliland and Ethiopia decide that they're going to go through with. What's also interesting is that in the past, I mean, they had to pull out because of the Tigray genocide. They had to concentrate their forces to commit the genocide. But Ethiopia used to be part of the peacekeeping mission in Somalia. So they were yeah, Amazon, fighting yeah. on behalf of the Somali government, their forces there before. So to yeah, go I, and I, now if, recognize Somaliland and do this, it's a pretty big shakeup of the politics yeah, of the region. I mean, if if I recall, their their troops might still be there till the end of it, till like now. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because I, yeah, the... I think that I think the Amazon troops are pulling out right now. The Amazon troops being like the African Union forces that are doing a peacekeeping mission. Yeah, one Somalia. of the reasons why the United States had to go back in is because so many Ethiopian troops got pulled out to go to Tigray. Um, You got anything else you want to touch on or should I get started on this um, big old big old rise up? Yeah, we can. Go ahead. Alrighty. So um, some of you, by the time this is uploaded, will have seen this but there has been a uh, a bit of a shit show, for lack of a better term, uh, coming into the fray in Ecuador. And um, basically, within the last 24 hours, you know, armed men who were probably almost all of which definitely part of gangs and organized crime groups over there have taken over t- a TV station. They've, um, you know, entered... Uh, high schools and universities they've set cars on fires set off explosions in the capital of quito uh you know there was one video of a guy who was armed with an rpg on the side of the road in the port city of uh, guayaquil um and you know it's it's uh it led it's reached such a point where the uh the ecuadorian president daniel nabao he, he basically declared like uh, like a state of internal conflict against 20 different um, uh, gangs or criminal organizations in the country. And um, 
basically, so to kind of track this back to what set this off is on on Monday, this guy who we have talked about previously on this show, if you, the few of you who watch this very diligently might remember, um, this guy uh, named Adolfo. This is going to be the first one where I'm going to separate this beginning piece too, so... Okay. Hopefully now people will be more up to date on like headlines if we start separating them. So, yeah. So this guy Adolfo Fito, that's his nickname, uh, Masias, basically on Monday, um, well Sunday he disappeared from his cell and and he was he was in prison and he disappeared from his cell. He's serving this like thirty four year sentence for you know drug trafficking, murder, being part of organized crime, all the good stuff. And he disappears from his cell on Sunday. On Monday, the police say he's gone. He is he's not in he's not in prison. And this this guy Fito, he's he's the the uh, the leader of this uh, drug trafficking gang called the Los Choneros, which the, the name comes from. They're from a, a coastal city in the country called Chon. So Choneros, that's that's w- what the name means, basically. And he, he disappears from his cell. Right. And um so the, the country's president declares a state of emergency for 60 days, which is kind of this thing Ecuador does anytime shit gets out of hand with organized crime groups. The, 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 whoever the president is back in like a couple months ago, it was Guillermo Lasso. Now it's this Nabao guy. They, they declare a state of emergency. That's kind of their go-to thing. They place a curfew, et cetera. And some some of the uh, organized crime groups come out and say, you know what, fuck your state of emergency. We're not doing that. And so the day after Fito gets out of prison, and all this stuff happens. You know, there's the video, the guys, they've taken over the, the TV station, the coastal city of Goyaquil. You know, they're, they're, um, they're attacking universities. They're attacking high schools. They've taken some of the students and some of these high schools hostages. Um, they've, they've, the prisons in the country, a lot of which are run by these criminal gangs, they've taken a lot of the prison guard hostages. There are several videos out there of them executing prison guards in some cases across, you know, prisons just like nationwide. And, um, yeah, so for those of you like wondering how it could have reached this point, we're, we're going to go back a little bit and then we're going to go back even further. So, this Fito guy who got out of prison, um, he's, it, I think it's important to mention that he's done this before. He escaped from a maximum security prison before, and he was on the run for 10 months. So, like, this is, like, the second time he's escaped from a jail, right? And so the reason um, he was he was in prison this time was, well, Obviously, you've got the drug trafficking and the murder charges and all that. But back in August, he was suspected of being involved in the assassination of the uh, a presidential candidate in Ecuador called uh, Fernando Villavicencio. And they took him out of the prison that he was, he, the regional prison that he was in, and then they briefly transferred him over to a maximum security prison called La Roca. And between him being transferred out of the regional prison and into La Roca, the maximum security prison, he got he ended up back in the regional prison. I'm not exactly sure what went down there, but somehow he went from the maximum security prison again after after being suspected of this murder of a presidential candidate back into a regional prison. And now he's out for all intents and purposes. Right. And. um yeah, and the thing is, and we've talked about this on other shows, but the assassination back in August of uh, the presidential candidate Via Vincencio was kind of a buildup of several incidents involving organized crime uh, or organized crime linked incidents in the country, right? So in, in, the, mo- in the month before that, just the month before that, uh, the mayor of the port city of Manta, a guy named Agustin uh, Intriago, was shot dead while uh, inspecting some like public works thing in the city. And that was on July 23rd. And so in July 24th, uh, the, the president at the time, uh, Guillermo Lasso, declared a state of emergency in three of the country's coastal provinces. Now, it's important to remember the coastal provinces are kind of the hotspot for this type of like gang and drug activity because 
this is where, you know, the, the, the gangs, the drug trafficking groups, whatever you want to call them, this is where they export and they import a lot of their product and their, they, this is how they make their money. It's through the ports. And um, this is obviously, if it's through the ports, that's where a lot of their presence is going to be. So on the 24th, he, he declares a state of emergency because there were clashes in just kind of throughout the coastal areas of the country that had left eight people dead. And then on July 25th, the president declares another state of emergency amidst violence in the prison system that left 31 people dead and 90 prison guards had been taken hostage. Now, when I'm talking about like, how, you're probably thinking, how can prisoners take prison guards hostage? That doesn't make any sense. Ecuadorian prisons are very overcrowded. They're pretty much run by the criminal groups. The, the clashes in the prisons are batshit insane. Like, to, to put this into perspective, like I was saying earlier, when Fito was transferred out of a um, the, the regional prison to a maximum security prison back in August, they had to deploy over 3,000 members of the security forces just to pull this off. They had, they had to send in 3,000 dudes to take one guy out and transfer him to another prison. And when they were in there, they found in feet, like where Fito was basically living, they found like a bunch of hash, a bunch of cocaine, speaker systems, stereo, TV. The guy had like multiple refrigerators. Like the guy, you know, it, it wasn't prison for him. It was a vacation. So uh, the, the thing is, is a lot of these, these bosses in these Ecuadorian prisons, they can, they can run their operation out of prison. And the the gangs basically run the prison, right? Which is why you see as soon as Fito's out of jail and they declare the state of emergency, you see, you know, prison guards being taken hostage. Who's to, you know, and I I mean, like, when I say taken hostage, I'm using that term loosely because these could be guys who have been taken hostage by the, the gang members who are in prison, like, previously. They were already, they were already hostages to begin with. But, you know, I mean, it's the, the clashes in Ecuador's prisons have, have been like a pretty big national topic for a while now. As far as I know, I think over 400 people have been killed in Ecuadorian prisons. That's between like gang members and clashes between like gang members and guards and, you know, just bystanders, bystanders. I'm sorry, like, you know, the guy who robbed a bank who's in the prison got killed or whatever that that over 400 people have been killed in these prisons nationally since like 2021 so it's it's a very like sensitive issue at the time i should mention however um the police did manage to um the tv station i was talking about earlier kind of the video you'll see most of in this uh when you're you know looking at this conflict i guess you'll call it um that is uh that that has recent that 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 was um within like a couple hours that was secured by police and all the people involved in taking the tv crew and the you know the 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 people in the station hostage were arrested so yeah i mean this is kind of a developing story there's a lot yet to be seen i mean you know the the way the way it seems is it's pretty much more or less that the government has declared war on 20 different like criminal gangs and um it it remains to be seen what's going to happen whether they're going to get this under control or if it's going to like explode into a wider thing and you know if it wasn't already clear from my explanation this is kind of something that's been building up kind of you know you know ecuador's always had an organized crime problem since like the 90s and, you know, it kind of really got out into the early 2000s. And it kind of seems that with the issue, the things that have happened over there within the last six months, that this is kind of the culmination of all of that just kind of exploding onto the surface, you know. So it remains to be seen what's going to be happening. Some analysts believe, and I remember people were saying this back in August when Via Vincencio was assassinated, but some people believe that the reason mm. criminal organizations in Ecuador have gotten more pulled is because since there are a lot of different peace deals with groups like FARC and the ELN in, um, uh, in Colombia, that they're thinking the tide is shifting from Colombia being the main cocaine exporter of the world to Ecuador. So the Mexican cartels who, you know, traffic cocaine 
up into the U.S. and worldwide, basically, there's this I, there's this belief among some analysts that they're shifting kind of that operation to Ecuador since it's not as feasible through through Colombia nowadays for several reasons, including like the crack, just the general, not just like the peace deals, but crack down on the general production of cocaine and things like that. Even they so, can't use the Darko subs really anymore. Who, who's to say? I mean, most of the smuggling in uh, Ecuador is being done through the ports. So, yeah. I mean, it, it's kind of like it's one of those things again. And you should it should be noted that, you know, the, the gang that um, Los Choneros, the gang that Fito's the head of, it has like these alleged but unconfirmed ties to the Sinaloa cartel. Now, if you ask a lot of people, they'll say those ties are definitely confirmed. But yeah, I mean, it's it's kind of uh, just a, uh, this what's what's exploded in Ecuador right now is a bit of a culmination of things that have uh, that have been building up for the last six months, if not the last 20 years. So as well with Mexico, um, I would say that might be the one to watch right now um, as for like upcoming news, because as the year begins to start and the Congress comes back. They're still going to be holding these aid packages for Israel and Ukraine, and then we're going to want to get like immigration policy done. Mexico has started cracking down on immigration. Immigration has dropped significantly because they're preventing people from even getting to the border. And basically, in return, Mexico wants $20 billion to get work permits for all of the Hispanic countries in the region so like just not only like latin america but also central american countries here and um another part of that is that he wants the blockade on cuba lifted and the sanctions in venezuela lifted so along with that his there's also his rail project and he's leaving soon like it's 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 like the end of his term you're talking you're talking about amlo here correct yeah yeah so his rail project has just like he he is like advanced it through like making because like uh it's really a kind of shits on indigenous land rights and stuff this railroad that he's doing but it's like to link the poorest region in the south of mexico right and so it's supposed to be like a mega project that's supposed to uplift them or something but the thing is is that um, because it's been protested and like deemed unconstitutional because it doesn't like respect land rights. He's made it a national security thing to push it through. And it looks like it's basically happening now. So there's a lot of developing stuff going on with Mexico. And because it's a neighbor of the United States, it's more important than people think, especially when this is going to be a key component of when Congress comes back, because they want to make sure that we can exploit the migrant workers as much as possible. So to counter that, he's saying, they're going to get secure work permits to counter all the ones that aren't coming over illegally and then getting work permits when they're here, you know, and not even work permits, but under the table work and stuff. So interesting you trade off. Uh, speaking of groups that um, uh, transcend borders are, and are uh, an issue of national security. Uh, I, I did want to just touch on this one thing real quick. This is that, that was a really bad transition. I'm sorry, but oh, no, you're fine. <laughs> I did want to touch on this a little bit. So maybe a week or two ago, um, the, Isl the Islamic State or the so-called Islamic State or ISIS or IS or whatever the fuck you want to call them, they um, um, basically made a, a general rally or call to arms or whatever you will, which they label as, you know, kill them where you find them, which um, in, in ISIS speak is, is basically like a, a call to arms in a way. And it, it, w because of it, because their new leader has made this call, I guess, to different ISIS affiliates worldwide, we have seen an uptick in the last week or two in um, sort of, uh, you know, Islamic State attacks globally. You know, we've seen attacks in Nigeria, in Iran, in Cameroon, in, um, uh, in the Philippines, in Iraq, in Syria, in... Um, uh, where else? We saw some in Mali. Uh, now, it is, it is important to note that this doesn't mean, okay, I cannot stress this enough. This doesn't mean that, oh, ISIS is back out of the blue all of a sudden, like a lot of people on Twitter seem to think for whatever reason. 
it's very important to note uh, ISIS is whenever you see an uptick in ISIS activity, that doesn't mean they're back. That means there are certain circumstances that are leading to this uptick in, in activity. Okay, ISIS never went away. Okay, I don't know what Donald Trump told you guys, but he, they never. I think a dog. They they never they never left. They were always here. All right, and especially when you look at some of these, like for example, if you look at the Philippines and Nigeria. These are countries that see like ISIS attacks on the weekly, you know, Mozambique. This, this is a country attack. This is a country that sees like, you know, Islamic State attacks monthly, if not weekly, in some cases. If you look at Mali, again, a country where almost an entire region in the east is completely cut off by ISIS. Right. So it, it's like this isn't something that popped out of the blue. It's this just that just, they don't seem like a threat to the United States, so they stopped reporting on him. Pretty much. And, um, you know, this, this, is, this is more or less an uptick in activity as opposed to, like, um, an uptick in existing activity, I should say, as opposed to an uptick in activity that wasn't present. So this, this is kind of like, and there's, there's a multitude of factors that have led up to this. One of them is, is the, 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 that they cite at least is the war in Gaza. The other one is, and I've seen some people speculate on this is, you know, there, even before this, you know, a month, several months ago, you'd seen upticks in, you know, Islamic state attacks where you didn't really see them in places like Syria and Iraq um, which weren't really places where you saw upticks in, you know, um, uh, Islamic State activity or like the Philippines um, versus somewhere like Mali or Nigeria or uh, Mozambique where these things happen more regularly. So it, some people are saying that this uptick in activity is meant to spur like a greater, I guess you could say like Islamic State like push or I don't want to even want to use this word, but but comeback or like prominence that was already set in motion several months ago, if if you if that makes sense. So yeah, you know we've we've you're gonna see a lot more of this stuff going around. That doesn't mean that they're like back. They've always been around, but it is an uptick in activity, and it is something to to pay attention to. I think. I mean, six six months ago or so, they were talking, or people were talking about how ISIS might be looking to re-rise. Yeah, they so, always, yes, yeah, they yeah. always call for it. Yeah, mm. I mean, the thing, the thing that particularly worries people is they're worried that they, and what you're, like, six months ago, three months ago, what was worrying people and is what worrying people right now, you know, people don't care when, you know, the Islamic State carries out attacks in fucking Mozambique or Nigeria or the Philippines or wherever. But what was worrying people is that they might try to rise up a, more prominently in places like Syria and Iraq. And the reason that worries people is one, not only because of, I guess, the geographical importance of those countries for one, and two, the fact that there are US troops stationed there and the US has an obvious stake in those two countries. But the other thing too is, is once you have once they they would they would rise to prominence again in those two countries every other country with an ISIS affiliate would follow suit you know what i mean that was that's kind of the thought process behind it is it's like okay if they, domino theory yeah it's yeah domino <laughs> theory right <laughs> that the idea is is like if they come back to prominence in Syria and Iraq then they would become an even larger problem yeah. globally, even in these countries where, that, you know, like I was saying earlier, suffer from some sort of Islamic state attack weekly. You know what I mean? So, again, it remains to be seen what's going to happen. But, yeah. I think most people who are in the Islamist side, like their recruitment network is low because everyone hates them. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. Like, there's a lot of return to, to, to tradition in the sense of in like online jihadist spaces in the sense yeah, of like yeah, exactly. ISIS, we like Al-Qaeda now. 
<laughs> you know, well, it, I mean, if you look at ISIS, all they do is call people infidels and like you're you're an infidel because of this. You're a fake Muslim because of this, you know, and it's yeah, like it, it, nobody it wants to deal old. with those people. Yeah, it, I mean, it get, yeah, it gets old. Like there's no there's no line, basically. Mm -hmm. They're the yeah, Islamist they version day. of an SJW. Dude, they cry. <laughs> like, yeah, <laughs> seriously, they cry all day. They never stop. <laughs> It's Always like you know, and you you got you got to remember. It's like I feel like at least when you look at it, in the case of, you know, I think Al Qaeda and the Muslim Brotherhood kind of had this thing like among Islamists where they have a very acute ability to attract like educated and I guess you could say like I intellectual people, especially with the Muslim Brotherhood. You right? Know? They they have like people always... are talking about with Palestine now like a Muslim Brotherhood of Egypt resurgence if they deport the Palestinians to Sinai. And it's like, what about ISIS? What are, guys, mm -hmm. what about ISIS? Yeah, right. That's, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I don't think, I don't think Waliyat Sinai, the ISIS affiliate in Sinai claimed a single attack in 2023. I mean, when they announced the new leader and they did like, you know, every group has to, every affiliate has to send their pledge through like a video the, the Sinai um, uh, affiliate had like three dudes pledging. Like that was it. <laughs> like they had like three guys. <laughs> one last, one last. Go ahead, thing. go ahead, go ahead. I, like I was saying, but the, the thing that I was real quick, just to finish my thought, like the Muslim Brotherhood and Al Qaeda have this like acute ability to attract like smart, intelligent, educated people, whatever, because of their their history um of having leadership who are of that background i don't think isis really has that and that's kind of why the tide has turned against them in some of these islamist and jihadist they're, spaces there's you know founder in a sense zarqawi by all accounts could not read so yeah i mean he the guy i mean the guy was was like the guy was i mean he the, the zarqawi was no better than the dudes in ecuador right now he might have been even dumber you know what i mean like <laughs> Yeah. So before that guy joined, before that guy went old jihadi, he was like a pimp, mm -hmm. you know, a drug dealer, all that stuff. Like, so to wrap this up, um, the reason why this is in two parts is because Sino Talk is like he actually is like been to China. He spent time in China, so it's not just like some random guy who writes about China. He you know is developing a field you know he's like gonna be one of those next like thinkers when it comes to chinese strategy and uh, how to relate with china like it's only inevitable before he's on government advisory boards and stuff like that so it's a it's a very technical but it's we talk very slow but it's a very technical interview about china because most people who talk about china have never been there you know like Jack and I get basically secondhand information from people like this. And it, North Korea is even worse. You can get no accurate news from North I Korea. I mean, and, and the other thing you got to remember with Sino Talk is not only has he been to China, but he spent an extended period of time studying there, like in university. Mm -hmm. So, like, we're talking about a guy who has, like, you know, he's been very enveloped in, in Chinese society and, you know, academics. So th again, this isn't some dude who decided to make China his his focus area because he read a book on the great game between China and the United States. Like this is this is a very a very well read guy and well lived guy on this on this topic and country. Here's part subscribe one with to the Patreon. Patreon. Yeah, subscribe to Patreon. <laughs> you too. Yeah, call to action, guys. Do the call to action. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the YouTube band is for doing news. Share this to Patreon share this video. for one buck. Yeah, so, so we're also going to be totally, we're going to be doing, um, the next tier up, we're going to probably put the movie content there where we uh, mm -hmm. we have like a more like a film review thing that's not newsy at all. But we have a lot of extra videos and stuff for a dollar on the Patreon. Mm -hmm. And since uh, YouTube demonetized us for reporting on the Houthis, do, anyone who do you have, guys Do you guys want to like rewatch Ichi the Killer and then re review it? <laughs> I actually I used to have it. I don't know who took it from me. But that's um 
I was just talking about 13 Assassins earlier. It's the same director. No way. Really? I yep. should watch that. I'll yeah, watch 13 that. Assassins. It's so good. It's basically like a bug's life. We have a weapon more powerful than the British Empire. And that weapon is our refusal to bow to any order but our own. Any institution but our own. My name is Cinotalk. I run the Cinotalk page on Instagram and also have a Substack where I post articles about China, various topics, whether it be military, geopolitical, foreign affairs, domestic politics, um, pretty much anything under the sun. Hopefully in the next few months or weeks, more likely weeks, I will be expanding to the Chinese economy as well. And um, with that, I'm also one of the writers slash contributors to the Bulletin on the, on the Borderlands, a bi-monthly publication by Lethal Mind Journal. I run the a specific desk as the desk chief, and I write various articles, not only on China, but pretty much any country or any topic related to the Indo-Pacific region. Finally, I'm in the process along with Lethal Mind Journal and the and Quantico Warfighting Society in creating a Taiwani, a Taiwan invasion series where we discuss very aspects of a Chinese invasion of Taiwan, whether it be the how we got there, the historical context to it, the logistical C2, command and control, political will, forces that could more likely will be used with, by both sides during an invasion. And that culminates to, with a three-day war game in DC in December. Hypothetically, like with, of course. With the government and shit? No. Um, it's going to be with two to three universities and a okay. uh, private company who goes, who's going to be running the war game. So. Now, speaking of universities, every time I turn on Fox News, they tell us that all the Chinese are coming to our universities to steal our secrets. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, so that's a very interesting con uh topic because in some ways fox news is true but they what they're saying is true could they take a more unbiased and non-inflammatory view on it of course the majority of what they talk about the points are true the chinese they view the relationship between the chinese the chinese universities and, and the american universities well not not, not even american but Western universities as critical for them to become self-sufficient in certain technologies. So that's where Made in China 2025 or 2020, 2035 comes into play. Um, a Thousand Talents, that, pro, that program as well. Can you explain what that is for me? So the Thousand Talents program, it's also known as the Overseas High Level Talent Recruitment Programs. It's pretty much ran by the Chinese government to get people who would have the expertise uh, that they were looking for. Like, so for science and technology, think artificial intelligence, advanced computing, lithium battery production, advanced computer chip production and, and research. Now, one of the more interesting things about this program is that they're not solely limited to recruiting overseas Chinese. So you, so you're American born Chinese, your Chinese that were born in the UK, Japanese born born Chinese, Australian born Chinese, they're recruiting, they're trying to recruit people from anywhere, or at least any in any Western com uh, country. And so there actually was a case where a Harvard professor, I believe, was caught up in- Yeah, was this caught was up... pretty recently. I know what you're talking about. Yeah, so he was, um, he was uh, indicted, he was actually sentenced I believe he was fine, but he also had some jail time because he lied about his involvement with certain Chinese universities saying, oh, well, I didn't receive any funds when in fact he received a lot of funds, actually. I think he receives thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars. So that's a good uh, example of how this works. So it made in China 2025 pretty much plays off of the um, Thousand Talents program. They kind of go hand in hand because that's the initiative that they use to push to secure China's, you know, uh, position or place as a as a magnet for high tech industries. So again, going back to artificial intelligence, advanced computing, quantum computing. Not only that, but just going expanding more is like materials and in industry, the creation of new materials. So you're looking at materials that 
could be used artificially made materials or minerals that could be used in the production of new chips to make those chips run faster or run, or run more efficiently. Not only that, but that also has application in, again, lithium battery production, electric car batteries, electric cars that they're that China actually has a pretty good market for, not only within China, but throughout Europe and the rest of the world. But then also what's, what's also interesting is that they're farming equipment as well. They've, they're trying to use a lot of machine learning and AI to try to make use of all the land that they could farm without polluting the, um, the rest of China, but not, not only that, but be able to make crops that won't kill people. And I think like uh, they just had their recent like the CPPPCCC conference <laughs> where they like voted on a specific like environmental plan and all this stuff. They yeah, did. <laughs> um, but like what I was thinking out is just like uh, the way China, you know how Elon Musk presents technology that doesn't exist yet and acts like he could totally do it. <laughs> I, I feel like I get that same vibe from China, but their plan is to like attract investors and like get the technology to eventually like catch up to what they're actually advertising. So it's almost like a bluff gamble type thing. Uh, there's some yes and no. They do have a they do have a history of making art of producing articles and and scholarly research or journal articles where it's kind of up in the air whether they can actually produce the uh, produce this technology the best of it the best uh, example i can have i have is them able to produce um drones and other technology to find subs using 6g technology which the article the uh, the two or three art general articles that they produced on that is kind of iffy because one it was kind of vague on how they were able to get the data. Then two, it just seemed as if they didn't really know how to pursue it. But then not only that, but it just, I don't know if we're able, if they'll be willing to let other people or let, or let other entities get that research to prove it or, or pro uh, to prove or disprove it. Because that's the thing about science is that, or new science and uh, scientific research is that you have to be able to recreate those, recreate the experiment to validate it. But I don't think China will be willing to do that. Um, but going back, I, they do, they do attract companies and investors to get technology and how they do it is very, really, really interesting because if any company wants to invest and in, expand operations within China, you have to go enter in, into a, a joint venture with a Chinese company. Now, most Chinese companies are state or semi-state owned. So you're essentially going into business with the Chinese government and going back to Elon Musk, that's what he did with Tesla. I forget which one it is that he, um, I forget which car company that he- All of them, you know, he, that's, that's all his products. Well, yeah, I mean, but I know, but I know for, I know for uh, China, he, he went with one that- Yeah, I know there's a lot of Tesla factories or stuff in China. Yeah, no, well, um, the funny thing about that is that um, they're not all Tesla. <laughs> Um, they're all, well, that's um, what I was going to ask is what company did Elon go into business with? Because all, all I see him doing is pushing this idea of like, especially with the, what he wants to do with Twitter, right? He wants to, to mirror the, is it, uh, WeChat? Yeah. I mean, he, I, I don't think he'll want to like create a WeChat clone a west or you know western wechat clone because there's no need for that there's no will we need for him to buy twitter either i mean well well, well <laughs> that is true but when i say there's no need for uh, wechat like you think that there's no demand for it so it wouldn't even pick up steam that's no of thing. no i mean it would be convenient for people to um actually do that mm. um for people to actually have that app because what a lot of people don't get is that WeChat is what's called a super app. Yes. It's pretty, yeah, yeah. It, so it's pretty much like a, co a combination of like Twitter, Facebook, um, Reddit, Apple. Twitter, right? 
I it has some some Reddit characteristics, but to call it a clone of Reddit, it, I would be hesitant to either that. Mm -hmm. But um, one of the more interesting aspects is that you're you have the ability to paste stuff uh, through WeChat. Yeah. Uh, WeChat. That's one of the more uh, that's one of the more interesting aspects of that of the app, um, in which all you really have to do is like join your bank account to the app and preload it with money. Uh, you have the option to preload it with money. And interesting, because I yeah. I thought it would have worked like uh, kind of similar to how the the smartphone wallets work. Right, where it's no. just your card connected, but if you have to preload it, that's very interesting. Is it is it proprietary currency or is it the Chinese currency that they're using? Well, it's it's a little bit of both, and I say and I say both because I do believe WeChat has the ability to use um, the digital yuan that they're rolling out. I want to say they have the option to do that, okay. but it's mostly yuan based, in which you can okay. if you're if you're a Westerner. And you want to use WeChat to pay for it, but you don't want to go through the process of opening up a Chinese bank account because you can only get you can only do this do the uh, pay feature through a Chinese bank account with a, using a Chinese bank account. And so, if you have to do that, if you want to still use your uh, use WeChat to pay for stuff, then you have to ask one of your Chinese friends to gift you money or credits, hmm. and then you just obviously pay them back. Interesting. Ace, I think you were trying to say something. So uh, just real quick, could you go a little bit further into that digital yuan thing? What, what's like the main difference between that and like the, just the regular Chinese yuan? Is it just that it's you can use it online or like is it is it is it a different thing entirely? I would call it a stable coin, really. I mean, it's a digital currency that's delineated and governed by the people's make of China. And, and it's really what it is that it's so that people can, you know, it's so that China can actually, you know, have some skin in the game in, in the crypto, in the crypto game, because they essentially ban all other forms of crypto, except for the digital yuan. So in a weird, so in a way, it's also for them to control that market as well. Can you talk about how China controls like their economy and markets like that, including the digital yuan? Yeah. So I'll go ahead and go for the digital yuan first. They use the reason why they're rolling it out is that, and they ban all of crypto, even though they did say, "Oh, we did it because of the environment." I'm like, eh, "Is you really though?" But, but um, I digress. They um, the reason why is because they realize that you can use this digital yawn to pay stuff, and they won't have control over it. That they won't have that. Um, that people can potentially use this for nefarious means to pay people to produce anti-government, anti-Chinese government, anti-CCP um, stuff, or pay people to come to um, to attend uh, anti-CCP anti or anti-Chinese government protests. And so for them, they view that as a potential they view that as a potential way to get people to join up together to do those protests. So that's one of the reasons why they banned it. Matter of fact, I would say that's one of the main reasons to ban they banned crypto because and, uh, they banned crypto and introduced the digital rimming B or Yan is so that it can actually control people and control uh, the, the flow of this currency while also having the, while, while also saying that, hey, we're in the cryptocurrency game. It's just going to be under all watch. Um, how they control the economy going wider? They have what's called a state capitalism a capitalism market uh, model where you have one half of it's private, privately owned or quote unquote privately owned businesses in China, and then on the other side you have the state-owned enterprises. So think Nordico. Uh, Northeast China Industries Armaments, I believe that's what it's called. The various banks that they have, the six big banks actually, the Bank of China, the Construction Bank of China, the Industry and Commer uh, Con uh, Construction Bank of China, 
things as that that are st solely state controlled. And so you have this interesting two halves of the of the economy where yes, they have a private uh, they have the ability to, you know, private for private entrepreneurship, things as like that. But you also have these big monolithic state-owned enterprises that throughout the years ever since Deng Xiaoping opened the economy, either shrunk or expanded in, in importance. So that's where the, you see them control the economy. And then with, Deng, uh, with Xi Jinping coming out with his common prosperity model where you see where he's trying to spread the wealth, so to speak, to where most people, uh, to where most, um, most individuals can, um, at least have something can, or at least partake in the wealth that was created before he came or before 2019, before the COVID, COVID pandemic. And it hasn't really worked out. Um, and the reason why is because the way he went after the technology industry, most notably uh, Jack Ma and Alibaba, where he essentially destroyed Alibaba, <laughs> broke it up and detained Jack Ma and, um, and told him that this is how it's going to be. You can complain or you could just go to jail, uh, go to jail or you could just take this, you could agree to these demands or AKA reforms. Oh, uh, sound like I had much choice there. He didn't actually. Well, it was funny because Jack Ma brought it upon himself in many ways. Has he because, been a bit too outspoken, was he? Yeah, he, he was. Whenever you uh, give a speech saying that the private uh, financial entities, such as his, um, I believe, Amp Inc., I believe is what it's called, mm -hmm. or he was going to launch it, could do a better job than the state-owned enterprises, specifically the state-owned banks. <laughs> You kind of, you you kind of you kind of run the risk of pissing people off, in which that's yeah. what it is for Shady. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Ace, you're gonna there ask something. <laughs> yeah, I, I just I just I just kind of <laughs> forgive me. I just seen the uh, the Jack Ma like the CNN article that you have up there. That's yeah. Get regulated. Yeah. <laughs> but what I did want to ask is like kind of what, what's the deal with like ever since COVID, right? And maybe I'm reading this situation wrong. Maybe before COVID, Z was like this. But what, what is the deal with like kind of like Xi Jinping, just kind of kind of just staying in China? Like he doesn't do a lot of state visits these days. It seems like like they seem to be very rare, even as like the COVID pandemic has been you know mostly kept uh, kept at bay. So why, why does he why does he stay in China so much? I don't I, you don't see him traveling a lot. He doesn't take a lot of vacations. Doesn't visit a lot of heads of state. Or maybe maybe I'm wrong about that, but yeah, just a trend I've noticed with them. No, you, you're correct. I mean, it's 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 kind of it's, it's a lot of factors that go into that. One is the fact that he doesn't like to travel. I mean, it, he doesn't really know. I want to venture. He maybe he he probably is, is able to speak a little bit of English, but not too well. Um, same thing go with other languages as well. Um, he knows that he has to take care of the Chinese economy as well. And he, so he's kind of has to focus his ideals upon that, uh, his, his focus on that. Not only that, but just um, the other reason why is just because he just would rather just stay in China. Not only that, but he just, he probably has a feeling that I'm in charge of China. We're the ascendant superpower. You should come to us. This yeah, is that's how what I was kind of, that's the vibe I get. It's like, he's the king. You come to him. You kiss his ring, you know? Mm -hmm. And he didn't show up to the G20 as well. And I, and like, uh, but he showed up to the BRICS meeting, didn't he? Or it was in China or something? No, no, he went to, he went to BRICS. Yeah. He, and... I mean, he went to BRICS and then like, he was the only guy greeted by the president, I think. I, yeah, in which I'll touch Where upon was the this year. By the way, should, we should elaborate a little bit more. Where was it this year? It was in uh, South, South Africa. Africa, right? Yeah. And then where was the yeah. G twenty? That was India, right? It was in India. That's actually the okay. reason why he didn't so, go to India. <laughs> he yeah, didn't go so, to G twenty. <laughs> now we have a little bit of a ground laid for people. 
Um, for yeah. anyone who doesn't know what BRICS is, it's basically uh, like the uh, antithesis of the group of seven, the G7. And uh, they don't really do anything. It's kind of irrelevant. You don't really. Need to I, I don't think. They ran think, for a while, though. <laughs> I don't even think BRICS knows what BRICS is. So. Well, I mean, it would help whenever you have people who would who would kind of align on what the, the outlook would be. But you, you kind of don't have that. I mean, India and China illustrates that because she didn't go to the G20 because, one, it was held in India and He's kind of mad at India because of the border crisis that they had that's still simmering. Not only that, but just the fact that Mahdi and I believe some other foreign and, and some other senior Indian officials said that, hey, we really don't want to sign on with the um, with a BRICS currency because we know any currency that's going to be developed is just going to be the revenue be repackaged. And we would rather not be controlled by China. Well, while we're uh, while we're on the topic of uh, Xi, how would you describe the ideology of China? Under Xi or in general? Uh, under under Xi. Well, right now, with Xi, he kind of push it towards a more authoritarian cult of personality aspect or push it towards, towards those two aspects mm -hmm. where you see him promoting himself as the head of China as, as in what Mao used to do saying that I'm the Supreme Lord of China. I've helped save you people from, foreign exploitation by the Japanese and and I saved you from the US puppets that was known as Chiang Kai-shek in the Republic of China. Mm -hmm. But with Xi, it's like, I'm here to bring China to its glory age, trying to bring China to, trying to rejuvenate China. So if you follow me, I will lead China to its, we take its rightful place in the world. Then as you can see, Xi Jinping's governments of China, it's a really interesting book. It contradicts itself sometimes, but mm -hmm. that's she is a contradiction. So, would you would you say that there's an element of manifest destiny in his ideology? Yeah, yeah. Um, do you think Do you think that fuels this whole South China Sea dispute and Taiwan and the increasing aggression outwards to its neighbors? I think it fuels the Taiwan. In a weird, in a way, it fuels Taiwan because, in the Chinese perspective, they want to quote unquote reunify with China and make to make China whole again. But in reality, China really never had control of Taiwan, mm -hmm. even before they quote unquote lost it to Japan in 1895. So it's kind of interesting that they that they always take that take that route of. Oh, we're going to reunify with China, or reunify with Taiwan, or first first reunification with Taiwan, when they never had it. Yeah, because uh, that, that's something that I, I always make very clear whenever I talk about Taiwan is that China never had control, and especially not the CCP. Exactly. There, it was and, very. I mean, they could probably make the point of the Ming, but even then, the Ming had to go in and route the Dutch. Mm -hmm the uh, Spanish, the Japanese pirates, and just to be able to colonize the border, the coastal areas, even then that was yeah. limited. But going, going further, I think regarding the South China Sea and the other disputes, I think for, for Xi, it's less so of trying to create manifest destiny and more so rectifying historical wrongs especially along the Indian Chinese border, because that's a relic of the hundred years of humiliation in the Indian colonial era that was never rectified even before India declared independence. It was so, what, what, so what's the likelihood that this justification is going to be accepted by anybody that's not already on China's side? Surely it's not very high, right? 
Like this is pretty flimsy justification, like using hundred year old hand drawn maps to justify their claims over the South China Sea, for example. Can right. I just, can so, I just before we answer this question, I found a really great uh, quote from Xi Jinping, <laughs> and it just shows the power of Xi Jinping thought because this is a really quote profound quote that I found. Uh, People, if united, will be stronger. Wow. <laughs> so deep, I, my dude. To go back to Xi, uh, Xi Jinping and his, how he wants China, is, this is the reason why he wants to, why he made the uh, code of personality, because realistically, mm. that's all he knows, really. You have to understand, is the, is the guy, is the person that we know as Xi came of age during the Cultural Revolution. And even though he was a princeling, his dad was actually one of the founders of China. You can actually see his dad in some of the uh, pictures whenever Mao was on top of the Forbidden City, like declaring the PRC. You guys see his dad in pictures, spitting image of his daddy, she is. He's seen his dad go through, lose power because of various disputes with Mao. He went against Mao on certain things. And so that's whenever he, when Mao took out his anger, quote unquote, on him and demoted him significantly demoted him. The culmination of that is actually the Cultural Revolution, where his dad and him were given up by his mom, where his dad was tortured, thrown in jail, and he was sent off to, to go work in the countryside. Not only that, but his sister committed suicide whenever this happened because she knew what happened to females that were rolled up into this. I wanted to ask about the secret police stations that they had around the world, which is why I wanted to talk about Xi, because obviously that's a, a function of his control over society and control over dissidents and how he sort of uh, keeps that that iron fist looming over people who have gotten out of China. Um, so I wanted to talk about not only the secret police stations, but this, the program that they have behind it. Because mm -hmm. I, I feel like not a lot of people know about the program that's behind it, which is more concerning than the actual police stations, which also includes the um, Confucius Institutes, I think, unless I'm mistaken. I believe they're in the same same sort of system that China has. So yeah, so their, their soft power projection. Well, I mean, regarding the overseas Chinese police station, I wouldn't really call it a soft. No, not power not projection. that. But the that I was more referring to the uh, um, oh, the Confucius, Confucius Institute oh. and the uh, the systems behind it. That's more the soft oh. power push, and then obviously the secret police stations are the the hard power push against the citizens. Well, I think for the the uh, secret police uh, stations, it's not, you can't really call it a hard power or like a hard power projection because, you know, you, it doesn't really fit in with like power projection, at least, in the, at least like in terms of like hard and soft power. I think with this one, it would be more, we're projecting this, the Chinese, the CCP and the Chinese government are utilize those um, covert uh, covert uh, police stations to influence people to prevent them from speaking out or to mm -hmm. more or more uh, more generally uh, pursue them to or influence them quote unquote to go back to China to face prosecution for whatever cr uh, charges they have uh, their, uh, the state has against them now a lot of people didn't realize the full-on extent of these overseas police stations because we knew about this way back in january mm -hmm. of this year and they're like oh well i mean there's this one or two and then it came out of like you know there's like over 100 guys <laughs> throughout the uh, throughout the world <laughs> it's, it's kind of a big deal and and in some countries they actually allowed this to go on because they didn't think the chinese would do stuff would do the things that they were doing in them they thought that China would actually be a responsible country and go through the proper channels instead of like coercing people to go back to China. While we're on that topic, like when you're when you're saying like coercion and you said earlier, like uh, that they were influencing people to try and go back and face charges. What, what are we talking about in terms of coercion here? Like, are, are they detaining people? Are they like strong arming them? Are they threatening them? Like what, what's what's going on like specifically? So I think the coercion will go with takes on various aspects um, and it depends upon the ethnicity and then also the charges that the people would be 
or suspected of doing, quote unquote. If you're Han and if you did, if you spoke out against the Chinese Communist Party, they're going to bring in your family, your close family. It doesn't have well, it doesn't even really have to be your close family, as long as a family member. And they'll sit them, they'll send them down and have a video chat with you saying that, okay, if you don't come back, then your cousin, your mom, your dad will be detained. And we're going to keep detaining them, detaining your, uh, your family members until you come back. Not only that, but again, going back, depending upon ethnicity, they will face torture when they're all detained. Not only that, but just harassment. The family members could not be detained, but they could be harassed. They could be, I forgot what's the name of this, of the special program that they have, but it's house arrest. But instead of being able to leave whenever you want, you're essentially in jail, but at your house. Like you have cameras inside your house that are monitored 24 seven to make sure you don't leave. You have literally zero privacy and they will use that to coerce people into going back to China. Another one would be if they find out that you're going to a country that is may not be supportive of China, but will be but will be willing to look the other way, then they'll go out and uh, literally abduct you. That, that's that will happen with a human rights lawyer Lee C. Wen. I want to say he was in Viet Tinh, the capital of Laos, and he was about to go on the train when the Laotian authorities detained him and sent him back to China where he's currently is now, I want to say he is about to go on trial. For what exactly? For him, it was, I want to say, I want to say it has something to do with treason. Mm, okay. Going back to what I mentioned about um, home arrest, his uh, case was actually, and a good example of that is the fact that Chinese authorities actually did go in and install cameras into his house, on his, in his house to monitor his uh, movements. What do we think about? Sorry, also found this one. It says uh, it's 60 Minutes Australia, pretty inflammatory headline. It says, no matter how far you are, if you offend China, you will be killed. <laughs> yeah, welcome to 60 Minutes Australia. How do we feel about <laughs> how inflammatory that headline is? Is there any realism behind that? Well, considering it's uh, Australia and China has its claws pretty deep in Australia, it's probably not that far off. That's just my assumption. Well, it might be them just trying to scare dissidents, you know? Well, they, there was actually a there actually was a case where China actually did abduct someone from Australia, like rendition style abduction. And yeah, it was very significant because this kind of, I don't know how, I forgot how Australia, Australia responded to, the, to that, but, um, he, the person, the person was either a Hong Konger or someone from the South, but did a lot of business in Hong Kong and they would like Chinese, like the Chinese. Ministry of Public Security or the state, or one of the other state agencies abducted him, put him in a bag and took him on a plane and flew him back to China. It's insane. Yeah, he, it was, it was, um, that's why I say it was, it was almost like rendition. Yeah, for, for going Lu, he was previously arrested by Chinese authorities because he would take on the human rights cases that other lawyers wouldn't touch. He would help Christians, farmers who had their land seized by local authorities, but didn't give payment for it. But the most famous one was like the 2019 case where he helped people, the makers of a Baiju bottle that commemorated the uh, Tiananmen Square, not a massacre. Hmm. Um, did that. <laughs> yeah. It, that whole case reading into it was really interesting because even though it was in Chengdu, like in Sichuan, you just touching Tiananmen Square the Chinese authorities are willing to look a, look away at a lot of things in, in Sichuan and that in in that in the wider southwest of China, but that's one of the red lines that you do not cross. Yeah, it's kind of a, a touchy subject for them. They work so hard to try and remove that. Mm -hmm. They uh they really don't like people talking about it. Anytime you bring it up on Twitter, it's just flooded with uh, CID. It's nuts. They don't even. I mean, obviously, they don't really like like it on the Chinese web, even the various ways that Chinese people have to try to talk about it. They came up with some, a lot of inventive ways. They actually stomped some, a lot of that out. They actually caught on to it. That's so insane. Okay. Well, going, going back to the Confucius Institute and the, um, the policies behind that, can we talk about that a little bit? Yeah. So this Confucius Institutes were created as a way to 
project soft power, like Chinese culture, like get people to know what Chinese culture is and Chinese language, be able to teach it, uh, be able to take lessons, things as to that. Um, you can mostly find them in universities throughout the world. I know here in Texas, there was at least three to four, they kicked them all out, or at least forced the majority of them to leave, close down. And a lot of the accusations stems from the Confucius Institutes being a part of the Hanban, a subcommittee under the Ministry of Education. But realistically, it also has some connections to the United Workers Front. Okay, and elaborate what on is what that is, because a lot of people probably don't know what that is. So the United Front uh, Work Party, it's a department under the Central Committee of the Chinese Communist Party, CCP, where it manages relations with political parties. Historically, it used to be for work with other communist parties, but they expanded it to include other leftist uh, parties who may not share the communist or socialist values that they do, or at least not most of them. But then also with that, to gain influence over people who would be beneficial to China's objectives, long-term objectives, strategic objectives, thanks as is that. And most notably, they work in, they work amongst Chinese overseas, uh, overseas Chinese communities, Hong Kong, Taiwan, Singapore, the various Chinese communities in the West and Australia, in New Zealand, in the United States, uh, Canada, pretty much whatever, wherever there's a Chinese, a sizable Chinese community, you will find United Front work department there in various ways, in at least a presence. It's a, a United Front, of course, that's like kind of like a Maoist principle, right? It's more communist, but Mao kind of co-opted it towards his own ends, like he did with other yeah. communist <laughs> concepts. No, I think uh, Ace wanted to ask something. Yeah, there's this understanding that places Hong Kong and Macau might have their own sort of thing going while technically being part of China, they have like a, a degree of autonomy. If you could just like expand a little, like what is like Hong Kong or Macau's like kind of degree of autonomy and how much control can like the CCP like um, sort of realistically yeah. exercise over those places? For, regarding Hong Kong, you have to look at it from a pre-2019 and a post-2019. Pre-2019, you kind of have seen this battle between the pro-democracy and the pro-CCP elements within Hong Kong to try to limit mainland uh, mainland China's control over it. Because that's what the whole like national security law was about. Under that law, uh, Hong Kong has essentially lost almost all of its autonomy. It would have lost a, lot, a large degree of a judicial, legislative, and also, in a way, economic. And a lot of people didn't want that. They seen what happens when you let China do that. You know, China attempted that before in 2006 or six or eight, and that's where the uh, yeah, the uh, umbrella movement came out. They said absolutely not. And yeah, the 47 actually um, it is connected to 2000 to the 2019 push towards trying to get pro democracy majority in the Legislative Council. I believe that's what it's called. I believe that's what the Hong Kong Parliament is called. But as you can see, they were arrested and the trial is ongoing. I believe it's about to be done. And regardless of what's gonna happen, all 23 of them who are currently under trial are gonna be found guilty. Let us not play with fairy tales, if we will, and say that there's gonna be a degree of autonomy or sovereignty within the judicial, within that judicial proceedings. The person, the three judges who were chosen, they were chosen. That was the major thing is that they were chosen and that was a major departure from Hong Kong law. So they essentially broke Hong Kong law just to push the trial along or just to hold the trial. And one of the main judges actually has a history of handing out horse sentences to people two pro-democracy demonstrators. And in fact, I, would, I wouldn't I would be too surprised if that's the reason why he was picked, so that he can act, so they can actually throw the book at him, if you will. But after that, you've seen Hong Kong increasing, uh, you've seen increasing control of China, uh, the CCP within China through the pro-mainland uh, party, political parties. It got so bad to where they're now banning books about protests in general, but then also they're banning 
But then, no, they didn't outright ban it, but they placed a lot of limitations upon the LGBTQ games that 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 recently took place in Hong Kong, where if you're um, if you're wearing a gay pride shirt, you have to take it off, and if you, I forgot what it was. I want to say they prioritize them for taking pictures and taking biometrics, but if you were a participant within it, you've had at least you, they took your picture, like a full on body, like a full on like body picture of you. And they said it was for national security work. And so that should tell you where, how much autonomy Hong Kong has, which is none at this point. Well, what about what about Macau? Do they have any degree of autonomy, or is it kind of the same? It's kind of the same with Hong Kong, but with Macau, you kind of see them as a useful cast cow because they have a lot of gambling. Yeah, they got um, those casinos running hot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it's 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 kind of weird because not only that, but you know, Macau didn't really give. Uh, give us give the CCP as many problems as Macau or as Hong Kong, and so they kind of you're gonna. It was like more of a you're gonna lose your economy, but since you don't, since you um, are not, since you don't give us any problems with it, with us doing this as China, we're going to not force you. We're not gonna be overtly boot stomping you. Right. So check out, check out this little graphic I found. You were talking. It's all we're way past it. Sometimes I find great graphics right after we change topics. But I, this is from uh, you know Falling Gong Media. But like, uh, it's got like the United Work Front and the connections to Australia. Isn't that a fucking awesome graphic? Yeah. I who who made this before? Who made this again? Oh, I mean, it's like uh, it's Falling Gong Epoch Times. Oh, okay. Yeah. I mean, like, I. My biggest criticism with them, and I say this with the utmost respect for the Falun Gong, is the fact that they've been known to overhype stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we talk but, about this a lot. Yeah, so I mean, it's like, it's just from my perspective, is that, you know, we, you're giving the CCP ammunition I to further increase it. Yeah, so we, I mean, it's, we can get further into that, but I wanted to hear what Ace wanted to say first, and then we can come wrap back around to Falun Gong if we want to. Uh, I just actually kind of wanted to stay on that topic a little bit, but sort of look at kind of Tibet and Xinjiang or East Turkestan and sort of like how, so we, we know, right, that those areas are pretty much in some way or another occupied by China, but how, how do they, how do they exert their control over there? Like you hear, you hear a lot of stuff. You hear a lot of things about people being arbitrarily detained and tortured. But like from you know a more expansive perspective, how do they exert control over these places? I know in the past, uh, East Turkestan kind of gave them a lot of issues with riots and you know militancy and things of that nature. But just kind of, if you don't mind, like going into how China kind of keeps these these two particular areas under their grip. Well, if it's, I'll go ahead and hit on Tibet because that one's a more less known topic. Um, a lot of the same, uh, well, with Tibet, you kind of see some of the same things that they that they're now doing with Xinjiang that they they did first in Tibet. So you see the operating detentions of religious figures, intellectual figures, think people of that. Um, then you've seen the first marriages of Tibetan women and men to Chinese, uh, the, the Chinese uh, counterparts. Um, not only that, but now you're starting to see the CCP uh, government within Tibet actually going into homes and taking children away to, I forgot what you call them. They call them tech school, uh, training schools, but it's more like or daycares. But it's essentially what the Chinese, uh, what the Americans, what the American government did to the Native Americans during the 
late 1800s yeah, the boarding and school like, shit. re-education yeah. boarding school it's, yeah. it's, it's cultural genocide is, yeah and the, the thing about that is with tibetans it's very horrific because of the fact that it's very family oriented and you're taking away children you're essentially destroying Tibet, the the main nucleus of Tibetan culture, and and you know while China don't now while China says oh well you know the Tibetan children they're learning uh, they're learning um, uh, Mandarin and things as that a lot of the anecdotal evidence that is coming out points to them being essentially being told you can't speak tibetan you're no longer tibetan you're chinese so yeah it is cultural gen it is it is cultural genocide and then yeah and um the pushing chinese against against people who not only didn't speak chinese before but again they never spoke they, they just never spoke they never spoke they didn't they didn't really need have a need for to speak chinese they spoke because the CCP allowed them to speak Tibetan. And on the fluff side with Xinjiang, you see the same thing happening there as what happened in Tibet because uh, she actually pushed, actually promoted or moved that official who was the architect of the, of the Tibetan, uh, of the repression of the Tibetan people to Xinjiang. Something I did want to Kind of, kind of expanding off of this, as you're kind of saying here is obviously on the one hand, they're basically using the same playbook that they used in Tibet in Xinjiang, but, um, and they even have like the same official in charge of it. Mm -hmm. The, the thing I wanted to get into is like for both, right? What are the events that kind of led up to this extensive repression. From my understanding, it wasn't always great, obviously, but it wasn't to this extent in both of those areas. Mm -hmm. So what, obviously there's a history there and things like that, but what, what led to that? Like, what are the, in the modern day, what are the events that kind of led to this, like, I guess, extended police state or whatever you want to call it? Well, in Tibet, it was the uh, protests that occurred in Lhasa and throughout Tibet and throughout the region. I want to say in the, mid 2000s where you had them attacking han people at first they were peacefully protesting but then they the tibetans decided to protest to actually riot and start killing han han and to tibet and the uh, and the chinese uh, population and also that's in tibet but then also the people who were but then also the communist party officials clamped down on them but you have to understand this happened way before she came into power. This actually happened in during Hu Jintao's second second term, at least at the Tibetan part. And regarding the uh, the Uyghurs, the profession of the Uyghurs, that was more a combination of protests and you know rising extremism, as China likes to put it. But then also the fact that Xi Jinping actually highlighted the Uyghurs for this forced oppression. He actually came out and said that hey forgot what it was. Uh, it was a, a leaked internal memo that Xi Jinping wrote, wrote himself that said that the Uyghurs need to be sinified. And that's how he does So it. what I wanted to get to is, um, you know, something you do see a lot is you do see a lot of like um, Uyghur militants even in like Syria. But what was kind of the extent, like what were the main groups involved in like Uyghur militancy? around the time that this sort of repression started happening like who were the main actors how much power did they realistically have how much problems were they causing for the ccp like what was kind of the deal there well i think for the ccp or at least the Uyghur militancy within st john some of it was imagined by the ccp but then also some of it was actually real because of the fact that you know Xinjiang is right there near Afghanistan, Pakistan, Central Asia. And so you naturally had the people head off towards those areas where there was other Uyghur populations that was not under the C that hasn't been under the CCP's rule. Never been under the CCP rule. And so you kind of have that interplay, but you also have the uh, Chinese play it up after 9-11, saying that, oh, well, 
these are Islamic terrorists, right? See, in the United States, you can't say anything because we're taking care of, we're killing Islamic terrorism. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because I was going to say um, that they basically threw it away like, uh, well, we just learned from what the Americans did. It was like a, a, a cope or a cop out, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. I mean, they, they pretty much said that like the movement of East Turkmenistan or East Turkestan was a offshoot or had a close uh, or had a close relationship with Al Qaeda and the and the other regional uh, terrorist groups or Islamist groups in that region. But there was really no evidence of that. I mean, yeah, sure, you had these Uyghur militants. Yeah, you have to... a few like turn up in a few movements, but they left China, you know, already. Yeah, they these these were the people who left China. Like they never really lived there. And a lot of the you know terrorist attacks that were that they attributed to the movement, the the East Turkmenistan movement. It's the Uzbek movement. It, it, it's Uzbek. not even them. It's like yeah, they, it, ends up, it ends up being more related to the Uzbek movement instead of the Turkish movement. Yeah, I mean it's one of those things in which a lot of the evidence that they use is either flimsy or it can be attributed to other groups, but then also that they attribute a lot of the protests that Uyghurs did, or, you know, the knife attacks to that mil to Uyghur, to terrorism. I mean, in a way they are correct because, you know, they were conducting a terrorist attack. However, it was really a response to CCP policy. A lot of the issues that made, you know, I forgot who I, I forgot who's who was the main one who did this, who who did the study, but um, a guy who actually was able to go into Xinjiang and get some of the profiles or get some information to build out profiles of some of the for some of these so-called terrorists were really just people who were just pissed off at the CCP policies. And then, you know, after they did that, the CCP used that to increase the suppression, leading to the Sinjon papers and saying that, hey, we need to synthesize these people because they're obviously not getting with the program. It's interesting that you and John brought up um, how it could be attributed to like kind of other militant groups like Islamist militant groups in other parts of the region, because that that is like a, even today, right? A lot of their, a lot of kind of like the recent, you know, um, propaganda by IS, uh, ISK or IS Central Asia, it, it's literally just talking about China. And they're not even, they're not even in China, but a lot of their propaganda focuses on targeting China and things like that. Mm -hmm. so it's kind of, Go ahead. Just a bit of an interesting connection there is all, yeah. No, it, it is very interesting because, you know, I, ISK is in Afghanistan and they're trying to extend their influence into Afghanistan in which China actually, uh, in which the group actually did some attacks against the Chinese, uh, Chinese embassy and Chinese holdings within Kabul. But you still see them trying to expand which a lot of people don't really, you know, a lot of people try or try to say that, oh, well, this is a, this is a fact that, you know, China is going to go in, all in in Afghanistan. Like, not really, guys. It's just them trying to, you know. Well, well, it's also because, like, their main rivals, the Taliban, are, are, as far as I know, are doing business with China, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. Th that is true. No, no, and, yeah. that, and, and that's what I'm getting at is that the fact that, you know, a lot of people, you know, saying that, you know, Afghanistan is going to be towards, you know, China is going to go in there and like mine all the lithium and all the, take advantage of all the natural resources that the Taliban is going to give them or, you know, signing deals for. But realistically, I don't really see them doing that. Like they may try to, but as soon as they conduct, as soon as they are faced with a large amount of terrorist attacks by ISIS-K, but then not only that, by people who they mistreat, they're going to pull out. They're not going to sit there and just say, oh, well, oh, well, this is just a part of life, you know, like we, like the, uh, like the other BRI projects that we're doing in Africa or in 
Central Asia. I mean, that, that's that's kind of that's kind of um, part of part of their issue with Pakistan right now is a lot of their projects are in the Baluch region, and they've they've been targeted a lot by like the Baluch Liberation Army, the BLA, in like the last few years. Mm-hmm. So it's, but I, I'd imagine in Afghanistan it would be on a much larger scale. Well, I wanted to expand on that as as somebody who um, does a lot of like a. Uh, studying and reporting of Afghanistan. This whole thing about minerals being able to be exploited in Afghanistan, where they used to say NATO's there for the minerals, all this stuff. There has never been an actual mineral survey in Afghanistan. You can't. There is no infrastructure to extract the minerals. There is not a road system good enough to extract the minerals. Now, if China wants to try to build that road system, that's where you're going to have those terrorist attacks, because it's very easy to blow up a road. You know, and uh, with these mountainous uh, sections of Afghanistan, there's just really no way that there's going to be a mining operation that's even possible.